I kind of I realized probably halfway through my second semester my first year I probably did it on and so then I was kind of like I'm just gonna something basically all my elective is related so I was like I basically I got my answer really decent chunk of all so yeah it is I just I I know it's nice because I can have the experience so I can go into Oh, I've done you know, materials and organizational records. Uh, yeah, undoubtedly. Because I know I say that in the MI concentration program. Like, because I was like, I finished the requirements. It's funny, but it's like the distraction. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I guess we need to change that. Hmm. I'm lucky I'm not wearing the exact same clothes today. <laughs> You've done that before. I have, done, have that done that before. <laughs> Is everyone back? I think we're waiting for a couple of people. Right? There, there's some seats empty. Huh? Yeah, you're presenting. Mm -hmm. Oh, whatever you want. Yeah. I have my child upstairs. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Does anyone know? Is there anyone that was sitting next to you that has disappeared on a break or anything? Or should I start again? I see some seats with coats on them. Maybe I'll wait a minute. Okay. It's being recorded. Yeah. It's just it's just a way it's just a way to record it. Uh, it doesn't matter. Like, if you stand here, you will be caught on the camera. Okay. <laughs> But if you not, I'll probably be like from here. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to see? No, I don't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> but you can move because they can, like, they'll just be able to see the screen. Yeah. So it's okay. Oh my god, it was falling stuff. <laughs>
Okay, in the interest of keeping you all on schedule, I'm going to start, and I'm happy if anyone comes in while I'm starting to talk, I'm happy to re-say everything I'm saying now to them later after I'm done. Uh, so my name is Colin Anderson. I'm the Associate Registrar here uh, at the iSchool. Uh, we cover our PhD program, our MI program, and your program as well, the MMST program. Uh, I help coordinate a student services team uh, that is situated right across the hallway uh, in room 210. So if you ever need anything related to student services, if you have any questions about how the university works, uh, how admissions works, uh, what kind of supports and, and uh, services are available for you on campus here, uh, anything about even moving to Toronto, living in Toronto, what kind of neighborhoods we have around here, feel free to come into our office and ask us. Uh, looming in the shadows at the back of the room, I'm going to put on the spot a couple of our amazing student services team members. Uh, that's Christine, uh, who helps with a lot of registrarial things around the, the faculty, and Alex House, who's going to come and talk to you about career services uh, and work integrated learning in just a couple of minutes. Uh, has anyone made a joke yet about how everyone's sitting at the back of the room and nobody's sitting at the front of the room? That's how we can tell who the bad ones are, I'm just saying. Okay. But I want to point out, our current students are at the very front of the room, right? So These are your models right here. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about admissions and what we uh, like to see in a strong admissions application today. Maybe give you a few tips. I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, what we want to see as well. Uh, okay, so if you have any questions while I'm talking at you a little bit, uh, feel free to raise your hand, let me know. Uh, feel free to interrupt and, and come on up afterwards and, and have your questions answered. Uh, so what we look at uh, here for our uh, admissions application is really a, a bunch of little things that all add up together to form a strong uh, application. Uh, we don't look at any one thing in isolation. We don't look at a GPA and say, okay, this is good enough in, this is not good enough out. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way. We look at your entire application on a holistic basis. Uh, so these are the six things that we're looking at. Uh, one is the academic record, and we are looking for a, a GPA of about a B plus, uh, ideally. Um, you need a mid-B in order to be admissible to the University of Toronto. If you have any questions about what that means, because that means different things at different schools and in different places around the world, feel free to come up and ask. Uh, and there are other things that can help a lower GPA become uh, an attractive application as well. So keep that in mind as well. We're also looking at two academic references. Uh, I'll get into a little more detail about the references in just a, a moment, uh, but those are really strongly considered as well. The references are really important, so don't, uh, don't look the other way on those. Uh, the personal statement is also a, a key part of the application, uh, and I'll give you a few tips on that uh, in a minute as well. Um, we are looking for a few sort of specific things in a personal statement that, that really help it uh, shine for you. Your resume and CV help add context to your application. So it's not like we're looking for people who have a ton of work experience in museums already. Uh, it's not like we're looking for people who are midway through their careers or anything like that. Uh, so if your CV says that you had a bit of student employment or you had a volunteer opportunity and you were in school for this period of time, don't feel like that's a make or break part of the application. It helps add uh, value and context to your application. Now that said though, uh, I want you to include everything on your CV that you think could possibly be relevant, okay? So you might have heard when you're applying for jobs that it's best to keep a, a resume to about a page, maybe two pages. You don't wanna uh, overwhelm a, a job application with a, a huge 10 page resume. It's different in the academic world. In the academic world, we talk about a CV, we're talking about a full academic CV. Feel free to include everything. Go on as long as you need to. Uh, include all of your education, include all of your work experiences, uh, include all of your volunteer uh, experiences as well, uh, any kind of contributions you've made to cultural projects, or uh, if you have publications, go right ahead, although I don't want to scare you into thinking all of our applicants have publications. That's absolutely not a requirement. But my point is include everything that you've done that you think could possibly be relevant to an admissions committee. We won't hold that against you. Uh, an English proficiency score is required only if you don't have uh, education in what the University of Toronto considers an English speaking country. Okay, so I know that sounds a little bit vague and the reason is uh, it is vague. 
so if that's at all a question for you, uh, feel free to come up and ask one of us afterwards and we can let you know uh, what the situation will be uh, with your specific case. Uh, if you have uh, English language education that you've completed, you most likely won't need to, to give us an English score. Okay. Uh, and the last is obviously transcripts, which are a reflection of your GPA. So we'll need those uh, uploaded as an unofficial digital version at the time of your application. Okay, so you don't have to send us official paper transcripts now. Uh, we'll only ask for the official paper ones after we give you an offer of admission based on your unofficial ones. Okay, so don't worry about spending money and ordering them now, unless they're for some reason really hard to get, and then let me know. Okay, so there's a lot of words on this slide uh, about the personal statement. I'm going to boil it down to a couple of things, and then maybe I'll ask uh, for some examples from our students uh, afterwards. We get personal statements every year that say things like, when I was a five-year-old child, I went to a museum and I had a life-changing experience. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, same with all of us. We all agree with that. Uh, and that's a really nice thing to say in a personal statement. But make sure you're diving deep into that. Uh, we want to hear what keeps you up at night about culture or society or the way museums are working right now or the way they have worked in the past or it's any other uh, issue relevant to museums and, and our program. Tell us what keeps you up at night. Tell us what gets you up in the morning and what you're passionate about. Uh, tell us what you want to change in, in the way these systems work, uh, in the way institutions work. Uh, focus on your academic journey, uh, but tell us about your, your personal life as well. Just make sure it's a little bit deeper than simple autobiography. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Are there any questions about the personal statement? It's something that some people struggle with every year. So I want to make sure you're all very comfortable in what the expectations might be. We're not looking for a novel here. We're generally the strong personal statements are no more than a page long. Uh, they don't go on forever. Uh, generally speaking, they're more than, you know, three sentences long as well. Um, okay, you're all comfortable with that. Do any of you have anything to add to what you um, I just I'm want to say about a personal statement that says, I'm a good student, please admit me, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Because you said three sentences, and I thought that was definitely it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Do I have, I don't have another slide on uh, references, so I'm just going to talk at you about references a little bit. Uh, a lot of people uh, come to us and they say, can I use professional references instead of academic references? And the answer is, sure, you can, but uh, there's a caveat to that. And that is that if at all possible, academic references are usually stronger and more useful to us than personal references are or professional references are. Okay, so the reason for that is because what we're trying to establish is the probability of success that you'll have in our program. We're, we're trying to make sure that there's a match between what you want and what we know we can offer you. Uh, we're trying to make sure that there's a match between what our expectations of our program are and your skills. So we're looking for things like critical thinking skills. We're looking for things like writing ability, uh, creativity, um, research skills, uh, and analytical skills, things like that. Uh, professional references are usually wonderful. Uh, they're always positive. They always say things though like, uh, this person was a great employee. They always showed up on time and they worked well with the staff team. And that's all great. Uh, that certainly doesn't hurt you, but it doesn't give us any indication of your research ability, your analytical skills, things like that. So if you're going to use a non-academic reference, Make sure you've exhausted all your academic possibilities first because professors and other academics know how to write an academic reference. It's, it's something they do every year for numerous students a lot of the time. So they, they know what we're looking for. They know how to write a good academic reference. People in professions don't necessarily know. And so if you're going to use a professional reference, 
make sure you let them know what we're looking for. Okay, so there's no, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with coaching a reference saying, I'm applying for this program, uh, here's what the program's all about, here's what I'd like you to say, here's, here's what's important to them, here's what's important that I want to have shine through in my application. Okay, so make sure you let, the, your, let your references know uh, what you can say about them, and then they'll choose to say it or not, obviously. Uh, so last thing I want to tell you about is our uh, deadlines. Regular deadline is coming uh, right up. Uh, please try to apply by that deadline if at all possible. That's for our benefit and yours, because if you do by the January 31st deadline, we can consider you for our admission awards. Uh, admission awards are open to everybody that applies by this deadline, uh, and, and you'll be notified nice and early. And we really like giving out uh, these kind of awards, so please make yourself eligible for that if at all possible. Regular deadline though, you've got lots of time still, end of March and supporting documents April 15th. Uh, if during this time you have any problem getting documents uh, or you have any concerns about this kind of thing, we're here to help you. Uh, if you've asked a reference and they've promised you something and for some reason the reference isn't showing up and you need us to change your reference, just let us know, we're here to help. Uh, if you are having a hard time getting an unofficial version of a transcript or you're not sure how to uh, exactly how we're going to read it, maybe there's an issue with the formatting or language or something, let us know, we'll work with you to, to solve all that, okay? Do you want me to talk about fees, awards, and support? Is that what I'm supposed to talk about now? Okay, uh, I'm gonna keep going. So for fees, awards, and support, uh, the bad news is uh, fees for the MMST program are roughly 13,000 a year uh, for two years, presumably, if you're here for uh, for the normal period of time. Uh, the good news, though, is that we do have a whole host of financial aid and scholarship opportunities here as well. Uh, the first line of defense for you is obviously student loans and OSAP. Uh, th there's a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, one of which is it's a by far the most generous loan program you're going to find in Ontario. Most other provincial loan programs are also more generous than private bank loans are as well. Okay, so they'll give you more. Some of it will be a grant as opposed to a loan. Uh, some of it uh, you may not have to pay back as well, uh, even if it is a loan. So make yourself a, uh, make sure you apply for OSAP um, before you start here for sure. Uh, the other reason that I recommend you apply for that is that simply applying for it and making yourself assessed by the government will flag for us uh, when the time comes that you've identified yourself as having financial need. Uh, we have a scholarship program, uh, I should say a grant program here at the faculty called the Professional Master's Financial Aid Program. Uh, what we do is we cover 30% automatically without you having to apply to us, 30% uh, of whatever OSAP or another government loan program tells us is your unmet need. Uh, right off the bat, uh, you don't even have to apply for it. And so just applying for OSAP may make you eligible for that additional support as well. So try and open up as many doors as possible as you can. Uh, also, over the course of the summer, after you're admitted in August, September, that sort of time frame, we'll have uh, an online awards application open for you as well. You'll be able to apply for that. And then we have yearly uh, scholarship programs as well. Okay. Any questions about fees and awards? That sort of thing. No. Okay. You will have questions, so when you do, you know where to go. Uh, oh, external awards. I should talk about that. Uh, I want you to apply for OGS and SHRC. Does anyone here know what SHRC is? A couple of people, yeah. Were you aware that this program is SHRC eligible? Say no. <laughs> you weren't, and that's because uh, SHRC stands for the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, it's a federal uh, granting agency that spends most of its money giving grants to professors to conduct high-level research projects over many years. But they also run a scholarship program for master's programs. And even if you're not doing a thesis, even if you're not doing thesis research, you're eligible to apply and to receive a SHRC master's scholarship. Uh, so I highly recommend you apply for that once you get here. Unfortunately, you're a little too late for 
uh, this year to receive funding for your first year if you haven't already applied. But apply next year uh, and you could hold the award for your second year that you're here. They're high value awards. They're uh, approximately $17,500 for a single year. Uh, so it's worth applying. It's also good uh, practice for you if you're going to be in a cultural sector applying for grants uh, as part of your career. OGS is sort of the provincial equivalent of SHRC. It stands for the Ontario Graduate Scholarships Program. Uh, and it's run uh, through provincial money. It's a very similar application process to SHRC. And Christine, correct me if I'm wrong, OGS is still available for this year. What's our deadline for OGS this year? January 31st. So apply for OGS. You still have time to apply for OGS. Uh, we need a couple of references. We need, uh, again, a plan of study, which is different than your personal statement, but you can sort of adapt a personal statement into a plan of study. Uh, and then we need uh, things like transcripts. So apply for OGS. Make sure you look that up today, tomorrow, next week, uh, and apply for that. Uh, that's worth $15,000 a year, and it's worth applying, okay? Any questions about OGS or SHRC or any other award? Okay. Make yourself available for these awards, if at all possible. There are some awards that are actually really hard for us to give out uh, because very few people apply for them, and they're very specific. So you never know what you'll end up being eligible for. Okay, that's our admissions. Can you read that, blue on blue? Yeah. That's our admissions email. Uh, that's probably the best way to get your questions answered if you're not on campus. If you are on campus, feel free to drop by as well. We're happy to, to answer questions in person. Okay. Is Alex up next? Yeah. All right. I'll leave it at that for now. I'm going to be around this afternoon and throughout the day, so if you have any questions for me, feel free to come and let me know. All right. Hi everyone. You'll have to forgive me. I haven't seen my slides in a few weeks, so I'm a little rusty. Um, thanks for coming in again today. My name is Alex Howes. I'm the careers officer here at the Faculty of Information. Um, my role here is full time, so I am available to uh, support you um, during your entire studies here. So I'm going to be talking about some of the um, career development opportunities that are available to you um, as students um, and alumni, hopefully, uh, of the program. I will save time for questions afterwards as well. Um, so one of the um, services that we provide is, of course, one-on-one -on -one advising. Um, we do recommend that uh, at least um, at one point during your first year that you come um, speak with us to uh, talk about your career goals um, and strategize for uh, the years ahead. So um, we cover topics related to you know, specific job search, resume reviews, uh, job interview tips and practices, um, and just generally, you know, what can I do with my degree? Um, similarly, we have uh, various iSkills workshops that are offered um, by the uh, Inforum upstairs. Um, if you haven't made it up there, I'd strongly recommend you uh, uh, take a look. Um, so the iSkills um, is a series of workshops. Um, I think there's roughly around 40 workshops every term that are offered, um, anywhere from um, museum-specific uh, workshops to some career-related workshops. So these are some of the topics that we do cover. Um, again, resume writing, um, professional networking, uh, leveraging LinkedIn, which is also popular, um, and uh, portfolio building as well if you're looking to create a portfolio um, for your job search. So these are offered at the beginning of the fall semester uh, and right now in the winter semester. Uh, we also do have a job shadowing uh, program. Um, we have a number of alumni in the community, as you can imagine, uh, around the world that are available to uh, host you uh, at their institution for either a half day or a full day. Um, so this is, of course, optional, but uh, highly recommended for you to get a sense of what it's like to actually work uh, in a museum or a gallery setting. Um, so we strongly encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, as well, we have our Ask an Alum uh, program. Um, this is actually available to you right now as prospective students. Um, if you go on our website, um, iSchool.utoronto.ca, um, under the Alumni tab, uh, there is an option for um, Ask an Alum. Um, and this is a very informal networking, um, informal mentorship uh, program where you're able to see uh, a list of uh, museum and gallery professionals, again, that are out in the community um, that are willing to uh, support you and talk with you and answer any questions you have about um, breaking into the museum or gallery field. Um, so this is available for you right now. Um, and as well, uh, our job site, which is, um, I think I've heard it's our most popular website 
page uh, on our site. So um, this is our job board, uh, and we populate anywhere from probably five to ten uh, new positions every day um, that are in areas of both information and museums. Um, so this is a public website. Uh, it's on our website right now. Um, so I would strongly recommend if you're not uh, ready to start applying for positions right now, probably not. Um, it's a good way for you to uh, explore uh, and get a sense of you know where you can go um, once you finish your degree. Uh, there's also a variety of uh, volunteer and student positions that are up on there. So feel free to take a look there. We have a number of events, as you can imagine. Um, our faculty in our building is really a hub for a lot of um, industry activity. Uh, activity. Uh, so we do have a professional associations events that takes place every year in November. Uh, just a few months past, uh, we had it where we bring in uh, a number of uh, professional associations. Um, OMA, the Ontario Museum Association, comes in and uh, talks about some of the events that they have. Um, so it's a very good networking opportunity. Um, coming up in two weeks, actually, we have our employer showcase. This is our career fair that we have, uh, again, upstairs in the Inform, um, where we bring in a number of um, organizations to talk about um, some of their career opportunities. A number of panel net networking events. Um, you likely heard from, uh, from USA uh, and from CARA, um, the different types of events that take place um, uh, all throughout the year. Uh, and of course, various MUSA field trips. So I think this past year they went uh, to Ottawa. Do you guys go to Ottawa? Montreal, right? So uh, they do very exciting trips every year. Um, I'll talk about uh, some hands-on experience, um, what we call our work integrated learning opportunities, um, which you probably heard from already this morning. Um, our internship, um, sorry? Okay, you're about to hear from it shortly, so I'll keep it brief. <laughs> uh, I'll save the best for, uh, for Rachel, but um, uh, so the internship course uh, is an option for you. Um, the internship takes place in the summer between your first and second year. It's not required, but the majority of museum students do take advantage of this because um, it's work opportunity um, that uh, gains you academic credit as well, so certainly worth uh, taking advantage of. Um, so these are a minimum of 12 weeks. Um, these are paid or unpaid internships, depending on the institution, um, but for unpaid internships, we do provide some financial assistance um, from our faculty. Uh, and these internships take place around the world, really. We've had students at the um, um, British Museum um, in New York, uh, in London, and all over the world, really, uh, and of course in Canada also. So um, this is a really good opportunity for you to uh, travel a bit, um, see something different for the summer, and come back uh, and finish your degree. Uh, as well, a um, very uh, popular um, course is the ex exhibition course. Um, this is for students in their second year. Um, where you actually are able to work um, usually in a group of about three to five uh, students and working on a specific exhibition in a specific organization. Um, so really a good chance for you to apply what you've learned in your first year, uh, perhaps on your internship, uh, and actually create a really um, exciting and meaningful project um, in your second year. Um, this page just highlights some of the example career options um, that uh, some of our students have gone off into. Um, quite a range, as you can see. Um, on the right hand, you'll see some of the organizations our students have gone off to or graduates have gone off to. So, uh, again, these are global institutions, both here in Toronto, throughout Canada, uh, and around the world, really. So, lots of opportunity. Um, and, of course, it's important for us to um, take a look at how well our students do after they graduate. So, um, this is some helpful information. Um, you know, our students are very highly employable. Uh, we have um, about 86% of our graduates find work within the first year. Uh, and this is a breakdown of that. So um, there are a lot of opportunities for you to uh, go in the field um, and find work right away. Uh, interesting, half are permanent roles, half are contract roles. Um, and you can see the majority of these roles are in uh, the GTA. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for um, careers. If you do have any questions, I'm available afterwards. Um, but for now, I will hand it off to Rachel to talk about her internship. Thanks, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about my internship. I'm going to talk about my exhibition, too, because I've done it already, and, uh, and I'd like to talk about it. <laughs> do that. Um, I am a CEP student. I'm in my third year, so I'm graduating in June. Um, but I've done all of my requirements for both programs, so if you do have questions about those, please feel free to ask me. I'm also your tour guide, so you can ask me all kinds of questions on the tour as well. Um, but for my internship, I wanted to do something kind of niche. I wanted to um, gain experience in shipping and handling museum objects, um, which is apparently not an internship anyone's done before. Um, and no one still hasn't done it because 
it fell through for me. Um, I interviewed at both Total Transportation and Armstrong Transportation, which are two of the main um, shipping and handling uh, of museum and art in Toronto. Um, and I was offered an internship, but due to some company issues um, with Total, it fell through. Um, and then Armstrong had already given their position away, so unfortunately, I didn't get to do that. Um, but I also really enjoyed collections management. Um, so I emailed um, one of our alum actually at the Markham Museum. She's the collections manager slash curator. She's probably one of the first graduates of this program. Um, and she was more than willing to take me on um, and kind of let me create whatever project I wanted. Um, but they were in the process of doing a, an entire collections review. Um, they did an entire inventory of the entire collection. Um, and it is as extensive as it sounds. Um, so I was specifically working in one of their historic buildings, um, doing an inventory of the Wilson Variety Hall, which is kind of like a general store. Um, and then we would go through this entire assessment process of what is this object? Do we have records for it? What's the provenance of it? Um, can we continue to store it? What's the, um, what kind of, What is what word am I looking for? <laughs> condition. What condition is it in? Oh my gosh. Sorry. Uh, um, and just kind of like everything that pertains to the object. And then we would make um, a decision on whether or not it was something that could stay in the collection, if it still had value, it could still met the mission and vision and the strategic plan um, of the museum. Then once we made that decision, since the Markham Museum is run by the city of Markham, we had to go through several committee meetings. It had to go to the Council of um, Council of Markham to sign off on the decision. And it was an election year, so it still hasn't gone to the city council because lots of turnover. Um, so I'm kind of still waiting for the ending of this process. But I had my main project of going through and assessing 300 chairs. And they're all wooden chairs. And a lot of the, <laughs> the descriptions just say chair. Um, so I spent my summer just looking at 300 chairs, but it's kind of a different aspect of most people are assessing collections or accessioning and like bringing things into the collection. And I was basically throwing museum objects away all summer. Um, so it's kind of cool. But also one of the things I got to do was start researching for an exhibition. Like Kara said, um, my exhibition was held at the Markham Museum in conjunction with my museum. Um, and they had a larger topic of the movement of goods and services in Toronto and the GTA. And I was told my exhibition is on retail, um, which is a very broad topic, but I had to bring it back to the connection to Markham historically and Markham contemporarily um, and bring it under this topic of retail and in conjunction with the Wilson Variety Hall. Um, so they gave me a lot of leeway and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and like was mentioned earlier by Alex, you usually do your exhibitions in teams of three to five. Um, I did mine by myself. So I was very overwhelmed all the time. Um, but I had an amazing team at Markham who talked me through the whole thing. I learned how to write out my text panels. I learned how to use InDesign to create the designs for my text panels and my title. And we got community partners um, and they really taught me how to do an entire exhibition literally from ground zero until um, it was installed in November. Um, so it was up in, for the month of November um, and then had an amazing number of people come to my opening. Um, fantastic experience. I would do it all over again, even though I'm not really into curation. Um, and yes, definitely encourage everyone to take advantage of all of the opportunities that come their way um, because this exhibition kind of grew out of my internship. It wasn't anything that I was expecting. Um, and then all of a sudden, the people at Markham Museum were like, can you please start doing this research? And then they were just like, can you take point on this exhibition? And all of a sudden, um, my name is on the wall as guest curator. Um, so it was a really fantastic opportunity. Um, if you do have any more questions, feel free to come talk to me. Um, I'll be here all day. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us. Is there anybody after me? That's it. So as I mentioned okay. before, the MI session does start at uh, 1245. 
Um, so Rachel is going to uh, take anybody who's interested in going on a tour. Us, I'm sure. Um, so you could, if you want to take five minutes to go to the bathroom, grab a drink, um, grab some more food. Um, Rachel will meet everybody in the lobby. The lobby. There's a sign that says four stars here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Joanna. Do you know who's starting this? Probably. Because if it's Steph who's starting this, oh, do you? She started talking here last time. So we started recording after. Because she doesn't even use a microphone. Yeah, we have to put it on her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she walks away with it. <laughs> that was last time. She turned it off. And then we're just like on. Yeah, so I have to turn both on and turn on the camera. Mm-hmm. Right at the beginning. Yeah, I should be out by like a few minutes after. Yeah, I'll so be it's out like the like within two minutes. Okay. I'll just go talk to stuff right now. How about Andrea? Where is she gonna be in the double blue one? Mm-hmm.
I think there's a whole bunch of people in the double blue room that we have to wait for. Are okay. there a lot of people in the hallway? There's a few people in the hallway. Okay. Um, we're going to wait just a few minutes. I personally like starting on time, but um, there's another session um, that they'll be joining us, I believe. So in the meantime, how many people here are interested in the user experience design presentation? And those who put up their hand, are you only interested in user design or are you interested in another concentration as well? Maybe? Maybe? Yeah? Okay, so my guess is that you're also interested in ISD, is that correct? How many? Ah, so that's why I get to be the dean, because I can read mine. Um, how many other people are interested in the information systems and design? Hey, and are the people that are interested in the information systems design, are any of you interested in the human-centered data science? Ah, once again, I can read my mind. But, okay, so the other concentration, and this is where I always fall down, because it's very bad for me not to know all the concentrations at the tip of your fingers. So how many are interested in the library and information science? Ah, wonderful. Often students that are interested in library and information science are sometimes interested in the archives and records management. Some um, both, and how about anybody just interested in archives and records management? None. Archives and records management is my area of expertise. I came here more than 20 years ago when the archives and records management program so, as a dean, I'm supposed to be concerned not to pick favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, however, is, who is our associate dean, is in the information systems and design, and also helped a lot with human centered data science and teaching courses in that area. So, the good thing about the administration is not that we're not biased, it's that we're biased in different ways, you know? <laughs> um, 
So the often some people who are interested in archives and records management are also interested in knowledge management and information management. Is anyone here interested in knowledge management and information management? Ah, yes. And now I see this is where I get into it. Oh, another area that has becoming increasingly popular is the topic of culture and technology. How many students are interested in culture and technology? Ah, so we have some here. Oh, gee, yeah. And critical information policy studies. Great. One of the things that we're finding more and more is students that want to take one of the concentrations may not take all two all the required courses in both concentrations, but many students. And it's not surprising, there's more and more interest in identifying issues around critical information and policy, but also looking at looking at information critically and seeing what it says and you know, hitting and so Ah, and I believe we're being joined by the Dr. Is that right? <coughs> so what have I forgotten? Yeah. What did, I finish, did I forget any of the concentrations I got wrong? No, but the list that we have doesn't include CMT. Doesn't include CMT. Three, four, five, six, seven only, and then. Ah, okay. Let's see. Let's see. Um, well, we'll cover that somehow. And the other area, which is in a way not a non area, is the general program option. Um, it is where you can sort of pick your own and put it all in. Is there anyone here interested in the general program option? A couple of you. It's always, you know, it's, now one of the things I used to think about was that I wanted to ask where people wanted to be. And then after I did my, I will be back after I talk about community with the dean, to talk about the archives and records management. And then, you know, we see how whether or not people suddenly become interested, so we weren't interested in the archives. See the degree She's we just fill in time. She's not so we haven't really started. Yes, I am just filling time. But is Chen Wei here? Does anyone know if Chen Wei's here? Okay. Why don't we Oh hi Jenna. Wanna come down here? There is a great number of students who are interested in the library and information science. I have been doing the counts. Uh, why don't I check with Andrea? <coughs> Well, how many people are here are interested in the co-op option? I'll hang out with my research okay. assistant. Okay. Rather than, because I don't think he's going to want to be at the conference. No? What, is there room? Yeah, there's, there's okay. all this room. Oh. If you want. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be. Okay. Okay. If two ways not do it, because I saw him, and he said, do you guys want these two chairs? Oh, it doesn't matter. I think we'll be here. Okay. Okay. Our youngest students. Okay, if people, there are some seats uh, still down here. Uh, a few seats in. There is a seat here and a seat actually on the aisle, which is unusual. So why don't I get started? I'm Wendy Duff, and I have the great honor to be the dean of faculty. <laughs> faculty of Information is an interdisciplinary program. Not only for those of you, you're all here to hear about the MI. You've undoubtedly looked at our website. Has anyone here not looked at our website? <laughs> <laughs> That's Pericles. You will learn from the story. Um, you know, so you know that we have this real breadth of courses. We go from human centered data science, library and information science. Archives, we're interested in the old, we're interested in the new, we're interested in this very broad view. Also, our faculty come from this incredibly interesting range of backgrounds. So unlike your undergraduate degree, where you may have done a specialty in English or history or computer science, and all the faculty members who taught you probably had degrees in that area. 
right? But here we come on the full range. Pericles has a PhD in computer science. Jenna has a PhD in information studies. In information studies. Colin is actually a graduate of our program. Uh, I myself did my PhD in archives. So we have this, and, and we have a PhD in English, we have PhDs in anthropology. And so when we come to this faculty, we all come to study information, which you see on the t-shirts of the students that are here. Uh, and we do this, but we bring our very different perspectives. It also happens that the students that in this area should gather, all of you come from very different disciplines. And you come and you start to look at these questions around information and technology and communication from these very different backgrounds. Well, welcome, Siobhan. <laughs> um, and that is an incredibly rich and uh, dynamic things tend to happen in the classroom because of this. And I strongly believe that I think it's a belief shared by all of the faculty across is in today's world, we need that broad interdisciplinary, different perspectives, different points of view, different methods to tackle some of the most complex problems and issues that we're dealing with today. So as we enter this world of a data-driven technology, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, information professionals will play an ever more important role across all sectors of society, including many not traditionally seen as being associated with information technology. While the dramatic technology changes of the past few decades have provided a taste of what the future holds, the expert consensus is that the most radical consequences remain ahead of us. How many people in this room remember when there was not a web? <laughs> How many people in this room no do web. not remember when there when there was not a web technology? <laughs> you mean there wasn't one? The web has always existed? Well, that's the other exciting thing about this faculty is we actually have this incredible diversity of age. Last night I was talking to Alex, and they kept referring to me as this very senior academic. And I'm like, are they talking about the white hair? Or are they talking that I'm very knowledgeable? I wasn't sure. This is a critical time for the faculty where our mission is to support the humane progressive stewardship of society knowledge and information fabric. The faculty provides an interdisciplinary bridge that builds on technical expertise in engineering and computer science, long-standing staff in libraries, archives and museums, and the social, political, and cultural perspectives in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Our faculty members and students are trained to look beyond technology and algorithms to consider the social context in which they operate. We strive to craft policies, organizations, and systems that can and will be held accountable in a world becoming ever more dependent on algorithms and automation. Ultimately, we use our unique perspectives to try to discover <coughs> the best ways to create a collaborative, progressive, multicultural information society of enduring social and cultural value. While our faculty have very different disciplinary perspectives, we also have different backgrounds, different degrees, we study different things. What actually unites us is we firmly believe that we can make a difference in this world and the students that come that we help educate will go out into the world and in this area of this dramatically changing and challenging world, we will make it better. And that actually is what unites our faculty right across. We also, I would say, unites us is that we are very excited to be able to be part of a journey for every one of our students. <coughs> because personally, when I teach in the archives program, I know that two years after that first student comes in, they will go out and get a job, and they will be part of a profession that I care tremendously about. And so they will be my colleague as we work towards, you know, making archives better and more exciting and all of those wonderful things. So that is what unites us. But we heard enough for me, so you don't have to care about me when I say how they are. <laughs> and who's next? Kelly Bly. <laughs> Professor Lyons. <laughs> uh, okay, we, we did that this morning already. Oh, there we go. I've already talked. Okay. Yes, you did talk already. 
<laughs> okay, so so I will try to be as calm and wise as our lovely colleague, Professor Chen Wei Chu. <clears throat> I really will work on that, but I'm not <laughs> Professor Chen Wei Chu. I'm Kelly Lyons, and I'm Associate Dean Academic for the faculty and a, and a faculty member here. So just to give you a sense of the program overall, Wendy talked about all of the different concentrations. She, Wendy also highlighted the fact that we are multidisciplinary. So one of the things that makes uh, th this program so special and so unique is that we can dabble in, we can focus on one thing and dabble in other things and build knowledge around areas that we never thought we'd be good at or interested in or fascinated by. But when you come here, you, you become very um, intrigued by things you, you never even heard of before. At least that's been my experience. So we have, um, generally speaking, students focus on one concentration. Some students like to do two. I actually personally advise students to focus on one concentration and dabble in other concentrations, but we have uh, mixed opinions on that, so you can um, judge for yourself. Um, we have a general program option, which does not focus on one concentration, but builds uh, knowledge and expertise in the general area of information. <clears throat> If you choose a concentration pathway or two concentration pathways, there are required courses in each that will be spelled out. And then you will take um, also electives that, and that's where things get really fun actually and exciting. There's a co-op option. Uh, students are uh, focused on a concentration and then, what did you, are you asking people to cheer for me? Now? Yeah. Okay, uh, there's a co-op option. And uh, students will uh, apply then after they've taken required courses in a concentration will then go into a, a job for a, ter a term or two terms and focus on um, applying that knowledge in a workplace environment. And there's also for those that want to get really deep on a particular topic within a, a concentration or within the general offering is a thesis option where you work one.